I grew up in a small town that was isolated in every sense of the word. During my growing up years, physical access to the town was via a ferry in the summer and an ice bridge in the winter. We had only one television channel, the CBC, until I was a teenager, when a second one was added. But because this was a conservative Mennonite town, there weren't very many people who had televisions. So the lack of channels wasn't a big issue for many people. A lot of the people in town dressed conservatively. Dresses and head coverings was what was worn by many women. But even those who didn't abide by that strict a dress code, they still dressed modestly. Businesses weren't open on Sundays until I was a teenager when one restaurant and one convenience store began staying open seven days a week. And most of the people in town would have gone to church. All that to say, though I was exposed to more than a lot of the people I grew up with, compared to the world outside of my town, I was exposed to very little. I moved away to go to college, and in some ways it felt like it was a cross-cultural experience. The language was even unfamiliar. There were so many pop culture references that were made by my classmates that I had little or no knowledge of. This past summer, I accompanied my barely teenage daughter on a basketball trip, and so it was that as a middle-aged woman, I found myself in Sin City for the first time. There are barely words for the shock that I experienced. In part, it was because of my relatively sheltered life, but in part, it was because I had just spent months immersed in the book of Revelation. So this small town Mennonite girl walked around Vegas with her eyes bugging out of her head a lot of the time. And more than once, I found myself muttering, that is the prostitute riding the dragon. And this probably didn't make me anybody's favorite traveling companion. Walking through hotel casino lobbies several times, I saw people in this place where the sun isn't allowed to shine so that patrons don't notice the passage of time sitting in a hazy stupor, pumping money into soulless machines, clutching drinks that were the size of kitchen sinks. I saw people line up for all-you-can-eat buffets, piling their plates with one pleasure and craving after another, sampling them, then dumping a lot of it in the garbage and starting the cycle all over again. I saw men and women, eternal souls, objectified as sex objects over and over again, advertising promise that nothing was off limits in Vegas. There was no pleasure you could crave that she wouldn't satisfy. And there was no accountability for how you chose to satisfy it because what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What I found sadly ironic is that the city who promised endless pleasures couldn't hide the results of pursuing those pleasures. One evening while we were out walking as a team, I noticed we couldn't walk more than 10 feet without seeing somebody laying on the concrete, undone by the very things they had chased. Homeless people and drug addicts, they lay on the streets of Vegas in literal filth, destroyed by what had happened there. The prostitute had lured them in and the dragon had devoured them. In our teaching session last week, we got a preview of the last character to enter the drama that was begun in Revelation chapter 12, and that was Babylon, the great city. In the past two days in our homework this week, we were introduced to her in greater detail, and we saw the terrible beauty of Babylon, the harlot. We saw John's fear when he gazed upon her because she's appealing and she's alluring, but she is also hideously sinister. How are God's people going to be able to resist her? by remembering how she was introduced into the drama to begin with. Though great, she has fallen. We resist Babylon by seeing her not as she appears to her physical eyes, but as she is in her spiritual reality. To believers in churches that were tempted towards seduction and compromise, the image of the prostitute shouts, don't. This is who you're getting into bed with. She is drunk with the blood of your brothers and sisters. She is carried by the beast who is empowered by the dragon. And so today we're going to look more closely at what we were told about Babylon when we first met her, that she's fallen. How? Why? What happens or what should be done as a result? Let's begin by opening in a word of prayer. Father God, we live in the great city. 
the harlot and mother of harlots in so many ways. We don't have to travel to Las Vegas to feel the allure of pleasure at any cost, materialism, comfort, luxury, consumerism, because we are bombarded by it from every side. Give us eyes to see what you see and how you see. Give us wisdom, grow our faith, and strengthen us to endure for the sake of our eternal good and your eternal glory. Thank you that this will be so because of Christ. Amen. I like how every now and then in Revelation, John explicitly helps us to connect the dots. At the end of Revelation chapter 17 and verse 18, he makes clear for his readers that the woman, the harlot riding the beast, drunk on the blood of the saints, is the great city from Revelation 16, 19. The city that, though it was great, is fallen. The city that was going to drink the cup of God's wrath. That's the woman who has dominion over the kings of the earth for a time. So what that means is that for a time, this prostitute, this one who looks so spectacular that John marveled and feared, she has seduced worldly powers. They have gotten into her bed. They have paid to enjoy her pleasures. And so the first readers of Revelation, they would have seen immediately that because she is pictured as seated on seven mountains, the harlot is Rome because the city of Rome was built on seven literal hills, and it was called the city of seven hills. So she is Rome, the power that seduced its citizens with materialism and consumerism and the pursuit of pleasure. But she's also Babylon, that ancient city who did the same. Babylon was the world power that had exiled God's people, and she was known as the mistress of kingdoms. She enticed powers and people in her day to buy wealth and pleasure from her. When God spoke against her through his prophet Isaiah, he said, Now therefore hear this, you lover of pleasures, who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. These two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day. The loss of children and wid widowhood shall come upon you in full measure, in spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantments. You felt secure in your wickedness, but evil shall come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away. And ruin shall come upon you suddenly, of which you know nothing." So how can the harlot be Rome and Babylon? One kingdom that was ruling during the time that John is writing Revelation and another kingdom that has already come and gone. Well, it's because she's not just a physical city or power. She is that too, but she's also a spiritual place. She is the mother of harlots who is going to keep giving birth to more Babylons, to more Romes, to more cities and kingdoms and powers that will exist in defiance to God. There will be actual kingdoms, actual cities and powers all over the world that will grow and exist in the spirit of Babylon. And they will be Roman, and they will be British, and they will be Chinese, and they will be American, and they will be in all places in all time. And there will be people living in these kingdoms that will be citizens of them, but there will be people living in these kingdoms that will be citizens of the new Jerusalem, the holy city, the true eternal city. And these believers, though living in Babylon, they will witness to and for Jerusalem, the city and its king. And so when John saw the harlot, he was afraid because he knew it was going to be hard for his brothers and sisters to endure because that seductress, she was hard to resist. And so that's why in addition to being referenced in other places, John devotes all of chapters 17 and 18 to revealing the true nature of the prostitute. Empowered and enlightened by the Holy Spirit to write the word of God, John knows that his brothers and his sisters in the tribulation and the kingdom, they have to see Babylon clearly and rightly if they're going to be able to resist her and endure patiently. So let's see not what happens next, but what John sees next. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. 
So this mighty angel, it could well be Christ himself because of his great authority and the fact that the earth was bright with his glory. Glory is always ascribed to Christ and never to angels. So this mighty angel, potentially Christ, announces the fall of Babylon in past tense, as though it has already happened, even though John and his readers, they know, they see this harlot named Rome. She is very much alive and well. But things are not what they seem. Though she appears to be powerful as well as beautiful, the mighty voice continues to say, don't trust what your eyes see because she has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living." Babylon was always the place of demonic activity where it lived and where it thrived, even before she fell. But when she falls, it's no longer hidden. It's brought into the light. It's exposed. So before John and his readers actually can physically see Babylon as fallen, Christ exposes her as fallen. Over and over again, we hear a haunt, a haunt, unclean, unclean, unclean. And this is the repetitive cry. This is the echo of what lepers would have to cry out if they came anywhere near people in civilization. They had to cry out unclean so that people would know to stay away from them so as not to be contaminated by them. This is Christ's cry against Babylon. Keep out. Stay away. The summer before fifth grade, my family came to Calgary from our small Mennonite town in northern Alberta, and for the first time, I went to the Calgary Tower. And so that night, as we were walking through downtown Calgary from the tower to where we had parked our vehicle a couple blocks away, this woman approaches my dad, and she was dressed in a way that I had never seen before. I was intrigued. And she spoke to my dad, and she seemed very friendly. But though he was polite, he was much more distant than I was used to him being when interacting with people. And I was curious. So I asked him, I said, Dad, do you know who she is? And he says, no, Arlene, that's a woman of the night. And I know I probably asked a lot more questions after that statement, but I didn't get a satisfactory explanation. And so I was left wondering, what on earth is a woman of the night? It took several years for me to solve that puzzle. And I know that the phrase one of, woman of the night, that's an outdated expression, but it reminds me of what Jesus said to Nicodemus as it's recorded in John's gospel. Jesus says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Darkness conceals and light exposes. The light of Christ exposes truth. So to believers who may have been seduced by the cover of darkness into thinking that Babylon was safe because she was beautiful, Christ Jesus reveals she is just as dangerous as the beast because it's the beast that she rides upon. Babylon has fallen. Why? Because people and kings and nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, which we know in Revelation points to idolatry. People and nations have been willingly seduced into worshiping something other than God. They worship the comfort, the security, the luxury that the prostitute offers. John's first readers, they were tempted to join trade guilds and attend the feasts and bow down to the false gods, all so that they could conduct business and provide for their families at the very least, or continue to live lives of ease and enjoyment. And Jesus reveals this for what it is. It's chasing the prostitute. It's climbing into her bed. It's being lured into wanting what she offers more than what Christ offers, and then ultimately worshiping what she offers. 
And we who live in the comfortable West, we do not have to stretch our imaginations or travel to red light districts to see what Jesus is showing us. We are just as easily seduced by comfort, by luxury, by ease, by pleasure, as first century Christians living in the Roman Empire were. We also find it hard to resist putting our trust in economic security. Like them, we think that we can flirt with her without getting into her bed. But what she offers us to drink, it numbs our senses so that we don't have the power to resist her. It numbs our fear of the judgment that's coming to her and to all who are in her. And that's what John here is next. He writes, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. We know that Babylon is symbolic for any city without God for any world power that sets itself up in opposition to God, that wants to build a name for themselves. So like the builders of that physical tower of Babel that tried to reach the heights of heaven apart from God, people building this metaphorical city, they want to do the same thing. And God sees, and he will hold them accountable. And that's why he warns his people not to be found inside Babylon. Revelation 18 has a surprising number of close parallels with another chapter about the utter destruction of Babylon, and that's found in Jeremiah chapter 51. Through Jeremiah, God warns the one who dwells by many waters, who is rich in treasures, that her end has come, and she is going to be utterly destroyed. Three times in Jeremiah 51, 6, 9, and 45, God calls out to his people, flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everybody save their lives, forsake her, because her judgment has reached up to heaven and has been lifted up even to the skies. Go out of the midst of her, my people. Let everyone save their life from the fierce anger of the Lord. But what does that mean? The Old Testament people of Israel, they didn't have the political or the military power to prevent their deportation to Babylon, and they didn't have the ability to leave once they had already been exiled there. In fact, through the same prophet, through the prophet Jeremiah, God told his people who had been taken to Babylon, he said, build houses, get married, have families, seek the good of the city, pray to the Lord on its behalf, because in its welfare, you're going to find yours. So are God's people supposed to live in the cities of the world or not? Are they to seek their good or not? Are they supposed to separate themselves from the world like the Amish or like monks in monasteries? The community that I grew up in, it was very intentionally situated in a remote, hard to access, far from the outside world location because the people who founded it, they wanted to live separate from the world. But even though you had to ride a ferry or cross an ice bridge to get into the town, even though there were few TVs to stream in worldly ideas, corrupting sin still found its way in. And that's because sin comes from the inside and it works its way out. God's people are not called to physical separation. They're called to spiritual distinctiveness. They are called to live in and among the kingdoms of this world as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, displaying their loyalty and their allegiance however and whenever required. So dressing differently just to stand out, that's a fashion choice. But dressing differently to demonstrate loyalty to God, that's a kingdom choice. Watching shows that are different from what's popular, that can be an artistic choice, but sometimes it should be a kingdom choice. Spending your time and your money differently than the people who live around you, that can be a lifestyle choice, but it might have to be a kingdom choice sometimes too. God's people, they're not different just for the sake of being different. They're different for the sake of their king and for his kingdom. And so the Jewish exiles living in Babylon, they were supposed to live in Babylon physically while having hearts that longed for God's city spiritually 
And we're supposed to do the same. We're supposed to live like the faith heroes in Hebrews chapter 11, with our eyes fixed on the city that we know is coming wanting that to be our home more than any home we could establish here on earth. And so God calls his people to come out of Babylon because he doesn't want them to participate in her sins, which will cause them to suffer her judgment. When the Jewish exiles, when they were allowed to return to Jerusalem after 70 years of exile in Babylon, many of them chose not to. They had put down roots. They had drunk from the cup that Babylon offered and had dulled their senses. Instead of praying for the good of the city that they lived in, the true good that can only come from living in alignment with God's law, the people stopped praying and they started chasing whatever they decided was good. So when the opportunity presented itself for the exiles to return home, many of them discovered that the land of their exile was their home. Instead of living as captives in exile, they were living exactly where they wanted to be. God revealed through Jeremiah that what his people needed was to know him, and so they would need a new heart, and they would also need a new covenant because like an unfaithful bride, like a harlot, they had broken the covenant that he had made with them. But what God's people need God provides. God had promised his people through Jeremiah a new covenant, a new heart. And he had promised that for everyone who left the city of man to live in the city of God, instead of remembering their sins, instead of letting them pile up to heaven, he was going to forgive their sins and remember them no more. So the voice in Revelation chapter 18, it continues speaking. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. In case you're concerned, thinking, okay, wait a minute, what happened to this whole punishment fits the crime thing that we've been seeing in Revelation? It seems like a contradiction because Babylon the harlot is being repaid double. She has to drink a double portion. Those words, though, are from a Hebrew expression that mean duplicate or equivalent. So duplicate or match Babylon's actions back upon her. So as she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. Doesn't she sound a lot like the church and like the city of Laodicea? I'm rich. I have everything I need. Instead of glorifying God, she glorifies herself. She's proud. She's confident in her resources, in her abilities, and she thinks that she doesn't need God. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Only God is self-sufficient. Only he is the creator. All else is created and dependent upon their creator for what they need. In a city that thought it didn't need anything that it couldn't get for itself, it was going to be destroyed in a single day. It sounds a lot like the plagues that were unleashed by the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The harlot who thought that she was never going to mourn. She was going to be a queen forever. She mourned the loss of everything. She was burned with fire, which is the Levitical punishment for prostitutes. And though the city of Rome and the Roman Empire, though they looked absolutely indestructible when John was writing the Revelation, That city did fall just over 300 years later, and it was pillaged and it was plundered in under a week. She who thought she was indestructible fell hard and fast. 
I remember the shockwaves that kind of reverberated around the world when the Berlin Wall fell on November 9th, 1989. And I remember how during the next two years, country after country in Eastern Europe threw off communist rule in this surprisingly fast rush to the end of the Soviet Empire so that when the Soviet flag on the Kremlin was replaced with the Russian tricolor, it felt almost unbelievable. Though the Soviet Union was this mighty world superpower, a nuclear superpower that was capable of destroying the world several times over, it fell without one of her weapons being fired because, like we saw in Revelation 17, evil devours itself. A kingdom that is divided against itself, it simply cannot stand. Though the beast has used the prostitute, he hates her, and so he turns on her to devour her. So Babylon, Rome, any kingdom of the world is going to fall because evil self-destructs. God is the God of life. He is life. He brings life. Anything that exists in opposition and defiance against him, it simply can't endure. And Daryl Johnson, he writes that God doesn't even need to judge Babylon because she will fall on her own. And when she falls, the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her, they will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. Those who want power, those who have power, they're seduced by it. So when it comes crashing down, they mourn the fall of the mighty city. And the merchants of the earth, they weep and they mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold and silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is human souls. The merchants of the earth, those who were seduced by her prophet and who were fed by her greedy, materialistic appetite that she kindled in consumers, they mourn, not because they loved her, but because they loved what she did for them, and now it's lost to them. They traded all sorts of luxury goods, and the list here, it closely mirrors the list in Ezekiel 27, where the downfall of Tyre, a wealthy ancient economic trading city, was prophesied, including the trade of human souls. In their pursuit of wealth and luxury and pleasure, there was no price they wouldn't pay, even dehumanizing other people. And the judgment is terrible. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. I find the implications of the, this verse terrible to consider. Can you imagine the horrible, empty, gaping loss of discovering that everything that you have longed for is lost forever? In his letter to the churches, John warned believers of this very thing, saying, don't love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life or the pride of possessions, it's not from the Father, it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. When truth and reality are uncovered, all will see that not only is the world passing away, but its desires are too. Isn't that hard to believe sometimes? Isn't it hard to live like this is true, to live in ways that demonstrate that we know and we believe that when time ends and God and Christ are unveiled, in that instant, people will see the emptiness of what they've chased. And even if they could have it, they wouldn't want it anymore. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her, they will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. 
Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste, and all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? Remember that declaration from the Song of Moses as he's standing at the edge of the Red Sea? And he says, who is like the Lord? Do you remember the marveling of the earth dwellers in Revelation chapter 13 when they say, who is like the beast? Like was prophesied in Ezekiel with the downfall of Tyre. Now we hear not a proud, not a worshipful declaration. This is a wail of confusion. And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. But suddenly, instead of the cry of terror and mourning and lament, now we hear a very different cry. And it says, Rejoice over her, O heaven and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. When the two witnesses, the church, when they were killed in Revelation chapter 11, those who belong to the kingdoms of earth, they celebrated. They rejoiced over their demise, but now God's people are celebrating not because they're enjoying watching Babylon suffer, but because they see the outworking of God's justice on their behalf. They are seeing the outworking of Psalm 12, where it says, Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. And the words of the Lord, they're pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. And then echoing the prophesied downfall of Babylon through Jeremiah, a second angel dramatizes Babylon's fall. It says, then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. Like Tyre and Ezekiel, Babylon is thrown down, never to rise again. And the angel goes on to announce that the sights and the sounds and the activities that are associated with human life in community, they cease. It says, And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters, will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. Remember how the churches in Thyatira couldn't practice their craft or conduct their trade because of the trade guilds? Now that's going to cease for the cities of the world. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. Remember Jezebel in the church in Thyatira, how she was luring her followers into the deep things of Satan? And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and all who had been slain on earth. There's an echo in this verse of the prophesied fall of Nineveh, which we can read about in the first chapter of the book of Nahum. And so we've seen that the great city, the harlot, has been Babylon, has been Rome, has been Tyre, has been Nineveh. She's not one city. She's not one nation. She is every city. She is every nation. She is all forms of government and political power that pursue their own glory rather than giving glory to Christ. And as Graham Goldsworthy has said, evil cannot preserve order, it can only consume it. Every kingdom that sets itself up against the kingdom of God is doomed to fail. And we have to know this. If we are going to resist the seductive charm of living within the city of man, we have to remember what we were told in Revelation chapter 17, they will make war on the Lamb. 
and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. The last character introduced into the drama, she's the first to fall. The harlot, she rides the beast to her destruction, and she takes down all who were found in her bed. And that's a scary picture, but we must not lose hope because we know the harlot is fallen. Evil will not prevail. And the harlot, she looks enticing on the surface, but there is another woman coming, and her beauty is not false. Her beauty will not be diminished. This week and next week, we are going to meet the bride. And seeing her helps us to resist the harlot because once we've seen the bride, the harlot is going to lose her appeal. Babylon is a city in which the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard anymore, but there is a city that is a bride. And this woman, this city, is not building a tower that reaches up to heaven and to God. She is coming down from heaven, from God. And the crowd that we have heard praising God for his great salvation from heaven, we're going to hear it again. And when we get to really see and gaze upon the bride in the final chapters of Revelation, we're going to see that she is truly beautiful. She is pure and she will never be attacked or harassed or tempted again. And from her, eternal praises are going to ring out for her bridegroom, the king, who is her glory and he is her praise. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. The bride is coming. She is beautiful. She is glorious in splendor. She is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Christ's bride is his church. It's all who are found in him. And this is what John is peeling back the curtain for us to see. As the bride, we should not live like, we should not act like the harlot. Revelation 17 and 18, they call us to resist the seduction of the prostitute riding the dragon. It begs us to ask God to shape and refine our desires so that we chase the things that are going to endure, that are going to truly satisfy rather than the things that leave us empty and lead towards death. The great city of man is falling, but the great city of God is rising and she will be truly glorious. Endure. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to see what you see, to see how you see. I pray that you would refine our appetites, our cravings, our desires, so that they align with yours, so that we are filled with longing for that which will last, which will satisfy, which will endure, and which is truly beautiful. God, help us to see past the surface of things that make good promises and maybe look good on the surface, but underneath they're rotting, they're dying, they're feeding on themselves. Help us to see that so we can resist them. And God, help us to resist with our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. God, help us to endure with our eyes fixed on you because someday we will be seated with you in heaven and it will be glorious. And God, that is not just a hope for eternity. That is a hope for now. It is a hope for us as we live among the cities of man with our eyes fixed on the cities of God. Help us to live here as a witness Lord God, to the kingdom that is coming. Help us to shine your light in the darkness so that others around us will see the king in all his glory and that they will be drawn to him in love and a desire to serve him and to share in his joy. So Lord, strengthen us, give us joy and peace as we endure. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.